will be talking today about the um, uh, neurophysiology of AFM, um, which really refers to um, the performance of uh, EMG and, and nerve conduction studies in these patients. Uh, so today I'll be talking uh, first about a, a general broad overview to what electromyography and nerve conduction or EMG are, uh, and then talk about EMG findings in AFM, um, and then talk about the challenges for doing these studies in, uh, in AFM patients, um, and then finally the, uh, the uses for EMG and what it can teach us about the disease. Um, so one sec. Okay. Um, so here's an example of a nerve conduction study. This, uh, the overall study of EMG has two parts, the first part being nerve conduction. Uh, and the way that we do this is to uh, apply a stimulating electrode over uh, a nerve that lies close to the skin, uh, provide an electrical stimulus, and then record it either at a different point on the nerve uh, or over the muscle. So as I was mentioning, this is an example of what recording looks like. Um, uh, there's the stimulating electrode. Uh, and then the recording electrode. And that allows us to record a, a waveform uh, of how the electricity is traveling through the nerve. Uh, the information that we can get from this, uh, uh, largely the, the size of the response or the amplitude teaches us uh, how many axons are present and functioning normally in the nerve, uh, whereas a decreased amplitude would tell you that there's loss of axons. Uh, whereas the velocity of that conduction tells us more about the, the myelin sheath or the lining of the nerve that controls how fast electricity uh, propagates. Uh, the second part of the test is electromyography or EMG. Um, this is where a needle electrode is placed into the muscle. Here's an, a, a diagram here showing uh, how it would be inserted into the biceps. Uh, and then we do two things. We ask the patient just to simply relax as best they can and watch what the spontaneous activity of that muscle is. Uh, in a healthy muscle, it should be nice and quiet, but denervated muscle, like we see in AFM, will have spontaneous activity in this part of the test. Mm, excuse me. And then we ask the patient to gently uh, uh, activate the muscle. So in this case, it would be flexing the elbow. Uh, and there we can look at the configuration of the responses as well as the way that it recruits as they, as they gradually use more force uh, to tell uh, whether or not the problem that they're having uh, originates in the nerve or the muscle. Uh, and also look at features of, uh, of recovery from, from injury. In general, these are the patterns that we can uh, identify by EMG. Uh, to orient into the diagram that we'll be using here, these are uh, motor neurons whose cell bodies live in the spinal cord. They send an axon out through the nerve, and then each motor neuron will innervate multiple muscle fibers within the muscle. Everything here that's in blue is one motor unit. Uh, so that's the, uh, the, motor, ner the um, motor neuron and the muscle fibers that it, uh, that it innervates. Uh, and then everything in red is a second motor unit. Um, we can see uh, one of two patterns leading to weakness, either a neurogenic injury or a myopathic injury. Um, so in the case of a neurogenic injury, you lose the neuron that is going to a portion of the muscle and those muscle fibers are now denervated. A myopathic injury would be, uh, for example, shown here, atrophy of all of the muscle fibers. Uh, and AFM is a neurogenic pattern. Looking in the chronic phase, um, we can see multiple different patterns of recovery from injury. Uh, again, identifiable by EMG. The first of these is collateral sprouting. Uh, so here's an example of where one motor neuron uh, and its corresponding motor unit have been lost, uh, and a surviving healthy neuron nearby will sprout and re-innervate the muscle fibers that were denervated. The result here is, is a new, larger motor unit. Uh, this is very, <clears throat> excuse me, this is very similar to what's uh, uh, well documented in poliomyelitis. Um, regeneration is what occurs uh, when there's an injury at the level of the axon, uh, which can then simply grow back and re-innervate the muscle. Uh, and then finally, reversal is where uh, the injured neuron is sick but not dead and simply starts functioning again. Um, so what's most commonly seen in AFM is, uh, is this process of collateral sprouting, just like in polio. Um, I'll show you, I'll come back to, uh, to this at the end of the talk, but there's a little bit of data supporting that there's uh, a reversal happening uh, in some cases as well. Um, so there's been 13 studies that have reported on EMG findings in AFM, usually as a part of a larger case series, uh, and they've been remarkably consistent in, uh, uh, in what they've reported. So uh, the findings are uh, reduced amplitudes of the, um, of the motor action potential. Uh, that corresponds to loss of either motor neurons or motor axons. Uh, 
F wave abnormalities, which also point to the motor side. Um, on needle EMG in the acute phase, uh, we see fibrillations and positive shark waves. These are abnormal spontaneous activity that indicates denervation of the muscle. Um, there's reduced recruitment of voluntary motor units. That is, again, another uh, pattern that shows that this is neurogenic rather than myopathic and specifically points towards the motor neurons. And then in the chronic phase, uh, we see uh, the development of very high amplitude, long duration, so in other words, large motor unit potentials um, that demonstrates collateral sprouting and re um, No studies have seen abnormalities on the sensory side of the peripheral nervous system and conduction velocities have been normal. So the overall conclusion here is that this is a motor neuron injury, uh, and that matches really nicely with uh, the data from patient MRIs and animal model studies as well. Um, adding to this, I'll go through a little bit of our primary data from the cohort at, uh, at Johns Hopkins. Um, we've collected 22 EMG studies uh, across a total of 18 patients. Most of these have been those that we've evaluated at Johns Hopkins or Kennedy Krieger. Uh, as well as two records that were extracted from the genetic susceptibility study at, uh, at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Uh, it spans a wide range of, uh, of times after disease onset from six days to seven years. Uh, so there's a nice mixture of both acute and chronic findings in this, uh, in this data set, uh, as well as some cases where an individual patient has been uh, evaluated at multiple points in time over the course of disease. Uh, one of the things that come out, comes out of this data is uh, the specific findings that correlate uh, well with uh, how the patient is doing clinically and might have some uh, predictive uh, prognostic value. Um, what I'm showing here along the x-axis is the, is the motor conduction amplitude or CMAP amplitude um, plotted against the strength of the muscle that's innervated by the nerve that's tested. So each dot represents one nerve and how strong its muscle is. And there's a pretty tight correlation between the CMAP amplitude and the clinical strength of the muscle. Though interestingly, uh, there are um, a number of nerves whose CMAP amplitudes are below the normal range, but the patients have normal five out of five strength. This is evidence of some subclinical injury in seemingly normal muscles. We also see evidence of denervation on needle EMG in these same muscles. And then there's a small number of patients where we've actually um, uh, evaluated the same nerve in the same patient at different times in illness. Um, and you can really nicely see how uh, CMAP amplitudes will evolve with illness over, over time. So as the patient is recovering, the CMAP amplitude will go up as well. Uh, and increase in CMAP amplitude is predictive of recovery of at least anti-gravity strength, uh, at least three, uh, three out of five on the MRC scale, whereas those whose CMAP amplitudes didn't change remained uh, quite weak. So putting all this together, the, um, uh, there's a suggestion that, that uh, the motor conduction amplitude could actually be a, a, a good prognostic indicator or possibly biomarker for disease and recovery. Um, we also suspect, suspect that needle EMG is a good way to identify those muscles that have no viable motor units and that are unlikely to recover. Um, doing EMG in this patient population is really challenging. Um, that's mostly because of the age of the patients involved, uh, largely falling into, into the three to five years range. Um, so this is a group who um, is not quite old enough to really truly understand uh, what the test is or why it's being done, uh, but definitely large enough to be anxious and fearful about it and to resist and to have a difficulty cooperating. Um, there's some technical challenges. Uh, the management of these patients often uh, demands us to test muscles that we don't typically look at for other causes, uh, which just makes it a little bit more of a challenging study to approach. Um, and then finally, misplaced angst about the EMG amongst a lot of medical providers. So there's a lot of misconceptions uh, that this is a very painful test, uh, that pe uh, I've heard people refer to it as a barbaric test that they would like to avoid at all costs for their patients. Um, uh, to dispel that, here's an example of some primary data from uh, Matthew Pitt's group at uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital, probably one of the largest volume pediatric EMG centers. Uh, and amongst their patients, uh, the majority of them rated their EMG test overall as being similar or less painful than a simple blood draw. Um, and certainly less painful than things like IV placement or other routine medical procedures. Uh, and they also identified some key factors uh, that influenced how painful uh, the, the patient perceived uh, the, the test as being. And that's largely related to which muscles are selected and how many. So what do we do to make this a more tolerable test uh, for patients and to get good, reliable data in this challenging population? 
Uh, the first is to do a very focused test. Only test what is absolutely needed to get the information that, uh, that answers the clinical question for the patient that's in front of us, uh, rather than attempting to do a comprehensive test for every patient. Um, in some cases, uh, sedation is required, especially when we're thinking about testing in locations that could be excessively painful or possibly dangerous. Uh, this mostly comes up in uh, respiratory evaluations. So for example, nerve conduction study of the phrenic nerve uh, requires a very high uh, intensity stimulus applied at the neck, um, which is just too hard to tolerate in an awake patient, uh, especially children, um, or needle EMG in the diaphragm or, or, or chest wall on a patient who can't quite hold still could, uh, could otherwise be dangerous. Um, we do try to do these studies awake whenever possible because much more reliable information is gained, especially about needle EMG in the limbs uh, when the patient is awake and, co and can cooperate with voluntary muscle contraction. Uh, so sometimes we uh, often will we'll opt for an awake study or occasionally we'll do a hybrid study where a patient is sedated for a portion and awake for, for a portion. Um, to that end, uh, working with our colleagues in child life has proven to be very, very important. Uh, I think we've had a very fruitful collaboration. Uh, child life specialists have worked with our patients before, during, and after the test to prepare them for it, as well as to help debrief afterwards. We found it really important to talk about the test with the child life specialist before actually doing it so that they know how to adequately prepare the patient. Are we going to be testing an arm, a leg, both, mostly shocks, mostly sticks, how many? Um, agreeing on using a, a common set of language uh, that's consistent between um, the child life uh, specialist and, and myself. Um, uh, and the language that we use does matter. So if you refer to the, the recording electrode as a needle, that immediately evokes uh, for the child memories of blood draws and IV sticks uh, that makes them very anxious. Um, if you describe it as a pin with a microphone on the tip, um, that's a novel description that's honest about the fact that there's a small ouch involved. Uh, also keys them into the fact that they're going to hear something, but doesn't necessarily provoke the same kind of associations with other tests that they've had that are, that are a bit different. Um, we always try to elicit and follow the patient, the preferences of the patient for how they want things described to them and, and how they want us to act during the test. Uh, we allow and encourage the parent to stay with the child throughout the test, uh, engage the child. So for example, having them watch with us what happens on the computer screen as they use their muscles um, uh, or using distraction techniques when we don't need to let them to cooperate like during the nerve conduction portion. Uh, and then medical play is also very important at this age group. Um, here's some materials put together by Allie Van Eck. Uh, this is an example of a, a story that, um, that was put together for one patient to go through what this test is going to look like. Um, and then also pretty nice reasonable approximations of what the equipment looks like for the child to play with practicing doing their own test on a doll both before and after uh, to become a lot more uh, comfortable with the equipment. Um, so how do we use EMG and AFM? Probably the most obvious is for diagnosis. So if for some reason there's doubt remaining after the initial investigations, uh, EMG can confirm that this does in fact look like AFM. Prognosis, um, which muscles are, uh, are injured, how badly, are they likely to recover and by how much. Pre-surgical evaluation for nerve and tendon transfers, this is probably one of our more common referrals uh, more recently. Uh, this helps us to understand is the muscle that we're thinking about likely to recover on its own without surgery or not. Uh, are the donor nerves that we're thinking about sufficiently intact to act as donors. This is another area where collaboration is extremely important. So I will often see these patients uh, uh, together in conjunction with Dr. Alan Belsberg, who's the nerve surgeon, uh, evaluate them together, come up with a plan, figure out what information we need, and then proceed directly to the test. Uh, and then finally, EMG can teach us a lot about the physiology of the disease. So here's an example of a, a surprising patient. Uh, this was a child who presented with near com complete quadriparesis, uh, but about a month after onset regained quite a bit of strength in the left arm. And here was his EMG. So it's six days after illness, very abundant fibrillations and positive sharp waves at rest. So these are abnormal spontaneous activity showing denervation, no voluntary motor units present in the muscle. So this is a completely denervated biceps. However, at day 62, normal. So this is a spontaneous reversal from complete denervation to normal without any evidence of collateral innervation or regeneration, and in fact, faster than either of those processes could happen. So this should suggest the possibility to us of the quote, reversibly sick motor neuron. There's one similar case that was presented in the Colorado cohort, also with a similar clinical improvement in normalization of EMG in, in the affected muscles. 
Uh, and then the well-publicized uh, cohort of, of patients with AFM from enterovirus A71 in Colorado, uh, in whom all but one of the patients had a, a complete and spontaneous recovery, um, also around the one to two month mark that suggests a similar process in, in that subset of patients. Um, and many of us are, are aware of sort of one or two anecdotal patients uh, with other, either enterovirus D68 or others who've had a, a, a large improvement either of the whole patient or of an individual muscle around this one to two month mark. Certainly not the typical case for everyone though. This is not a new idea. Uh, David Bodian made similar observations on poliomyelitis in the 1940s, um, proposing that at the time a patient presents, there's a large percentage of abnormal motor neurons and just a small number that are dead. And over the course of disease, uh, the abnormal ones will either resolve to normal or dead. And actually worked out in animal models in, in quite a bit of detail how these neurons look morphologically over that course of time. Uh, again, this was a process that occurred over the course of about one month. Um, so this suggests the possibility that weakness at the time patients present could be actually in part attributable to motor neurons that are sick rather than dead that could then later progress to death and, and, and permanent paralysis. Um, that opens the possibility that there could be a, a, a therapeutic window that we didn't otherwise expect um, where we could in fact target what's happening in the motor neuron instead of, uh, in instead of targeting uh, the virus or at least complementary to antiviral and immune-mediated therapies which to me provides some extra motivation for us to understand better the neurobiology of what happens in a motor neuron uh, after infection uh, to understand whether there are therapeutic targets that we can leverage uh, to promote this sick neuron progressing to healthy instead of dead. Um, and that wraps up my talk on, uh, on neurophysiology. I'd like to, to thank, of course, um, the AFM working group and of course uh, the um, organizers of this conference, Carlos and Christina, uh, for inviting me to talk, as well as the EMG subgroup uh, listed here for lots of helpful discussions and, and sharing of experience. Um, child life specialists from Kennedy Krieger, Allie and Cindy, uh, my colleagues in uh, Pete's and Ramosco at Hopkins, including Tom Crawford, who did uh, some of these EMGs and, and helped with the preparation of the talk. Uh, and then um, Priya Dugal and Aaron Millstone from the Genetic Susceptibility Study. And, and of course, above all, uh, the AFM patients uh, and their families. Uh, uh, for all that, uh, that we've learned from them. Um, and with that, I will introduce Dr. Ben Greenberg uh, from UT Southwestern, who will next be talking about AFM, putting the pieces together from admission to discharge.